Hello, everybody. A very good morning and welcome to, the, to Deep Tech Immersion Workshops 2020. An avenue, to, an avenue to navigate into deep tech to create a better normal. We know all of you have put in a lot of effort to get out of bed on a Saturday morning and to be a part of this workshop. And we promised you that this is going to be absolutely worthwhile. My name is Surabhi and I am going to be your moderator for this session. The newest catchphrase in town, deep tech, has evolved from what was nice to have to what is now a must have. Along with transforming the world by providing innovative technology solutions for various sectors, deep, techs, deep tech uh, you know, applications like artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, blockchain, cybersecurity, and many more are all used to solve real world challenges. But what is interesting is that this term still remains ambiguous to many. Over the next two weekends, in 16 sessions, via some great speakers from the academy, academia and the industry, we are going to get to you deep tech practitioners and researchers who will give you a bird's eye view of the most advanced applications in various fields. Together, we will dive deep and explore career opportunities in this space. To kickstart the series, we have with us Dr. Shantanu Paul, the CEO and MD of Talent Sprint, an entrepreneur, technocrat, opinion writer, and most of all, a propagator of deep tech. Shantanu guides strategy and growth at Talent Sprint. Under his leadership, the company has emerged as the country's leading youth career accelerator and technology platform, which operates high end software boot camps and uh, smart digital platforms to skill job seekers for the knowledge sector. In addition, he also serves on various advisory boards and committees of financial institutions and high-tech firms. A visiting professor of entrepreneurship and computing at leading academic institutions, he also writes regularly for business and mainstream media, including monthly columns for Outlook Business. Today, Shantanu will talk to us how deep tech is the new normal. It's quite interesting how COVID-19 has activated a reset button across the globe like no other crisis has done in the past. It has also brought to forefront the difference between digital innovators and laggards. Businesses and governments across the globe are increasingly recognizing that deep tech coupled with data and virtualization is what will enable a faster and more effective recovery. Deep tech innovation is now at an inflection point at every organization's digital transformational journey. Shantanu, over to you and over to you for you to guide us and tell us how and why deep tech is the new normal. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much, Surabhi, for setting the context uh, for this uh, presentation for the next one hour. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And of course, as an organizing um, company for this, uh, two weekend workshops on deep tech. Uh, I'm sure all of you who are participating, I see 250 people here already this morning. So good morning to all of you. And I'm hoping that these 16 sessions over the next uh, two weekends will really open your eyes to what is happening in the world of deep tech and disruptive tech. So what I'm gonna talk about for the next one hour is uh, not any specific topic of deep tech or because the rest of the 15 sessions will cover much deeper analysis and deeper exploration of those topics of deep tech, whether it's AI or machine learning or blockchain or fintech or whatever, IoT and cybersecurity, I'm gonna give you a much more of a broader view because the whole purpose of my uh, session today is to give you a much wider canvas of how big and disruptive this whole deep tech area has become and it's becoming rapidly. Also as young professionals entering the workforce, I think it's critical that you develop an appreciation for deep tech and also develop a certain amount of determination to acquire skills in deep tech because Frankly, in the new normal, and uh, so we talked about COVID being a very disruptive uh, phenomenon. I think the post-COVID world will require much higher levels of technology skills on the part of all job seekers and all professionals. So with that comes an opportunity. It's of course a challenge, but also with challenge comes opportunity, which many of you, and I'm hoping all of you in this workshops will benefit from. And I'm hoping that many of the things you learn over the next two weekends will serve as great launchpad for you for your own careers research and also perhaps your knowledge of uh, these spaces. So just to set a quick context of my presentation, um, there's just too much to cover in deep tech, so I will not cover everything, but I'll cover a few topics of interest to me, which I'm hoping I'll be able to excite you about. Uh, many of the things I'll show you will be familiar to you. Uh, so there'll be in some sense a recap. Many of the things I'll show you will be new to you, 
So please keep an open mind as to that these things are possible. And some things I'll show you will be really strange to you. You might never have thought this is possible. And it might actually make you very um, surprised or even little, uh, you know, it might give you a bit of a weird feeling to say that, oh my God, is this even possible? And why are people doing this? So with that being the spectrum, please sort of join me for this journey of the next one hour in which uh, we will explore these uh, topics. The structure of the presentation is about 45 minutes. I'll present uh, the content that I have prepared for you. And the next, last 15 minutes, we'll get questions. So please feel free to post your questions on chat. Uh, and the moderator, Surabhi, will uh, gather questions for me in the end, and I'll try to answer as many of them as I can. So with that being the case, uh, let me move forward. The first thing that I wanted to kind of point out is this idea of a Turing test. Many of you, of course, uh, probably studied computer science. Many of you did not. And uh, a Turing test, uh, which is a very famous idea, uh, and those of you who watch Netflix, I strongly recommend that you watch this movie called The Imitation Game, which is about the life of Alan Turing and, and what a Turing test is. A Turing test basically is a very simple idea, but a very powerful idea. The idea is that you know, when a machine begins to behave in a manner, by a machine I mean a computer or a piece of hardware and software combination, doesn't have to be only software, could be a, could be a robot, could be a piece of software, could be something, a cyber physical system, which has both hardware and software. When a machine begins to behave in ways that its behavior is no longer distinguishable from humans, it is said to have passed the Turing test. So let's repeat that. The test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to or indistinguishable from or at par with that of a human, then essentially that machine is set to pass the Turing test. I think for the rest of the next 30 minutes, you'll see I'll cover a lot of examples of machines that have passed the Turing test because they can behave in ways that we as humans can't distinguish anymore as to whether they're machines or humans behaving in that manner. This idea, of course, comes from Alan Turing. And uh, the famous Alan Turing test is that you know, there isn't, there's a, entity, a machine called A and a human called B, and then behind the screen, which is opaque, there's a sort of somebody who plays the role of a judge or an examiner who's C. And C will post questions to A and B, and A and B will give responses. And in the formulation of the Turing test, uh, as C posts questions and A and B keep responding, there's a conversation that happens between A and C and B and C as well. And end of a certain period of time, if C cannot tell the difference between A and B, in terms of the communication, then you have to assume that A, the machine, has passed the Turing test because it is behaving in a way that another human can't judge whether it is a machine or a human. So that's the basic idea. It's a very simple idea, but underlying all of this, you know, from this particular underlying framework, all of AI will follow. Uh, so when we talk about AI, machine learning, deep learning, all the things that you're probably hearing about, uh, at least in terms of buzzwords and perhaps in terms of some introductory courses, these, all of these ideas stem from the simple idea of a Turing test that how does a machine behave in a manner that is similar to that of a human, to the point where it cannot be distinguished anymore whether the behavior is coming from a human or a machine. So with that being the context, let's step back to maybe almost now 23 years ago. Uh, many of you on this call may not have been born 23 years ago. I really recognize that. Many of us were exactly you know, um, half our age at that time. You know, I remember I was probably 27 or 26 years old at that time. And therefore, uh, if I look back and remember my uh, so I was at that point working at IBM TJ Watson Labs in the US, which was the home of the Deep Blue, uh, the TJ Watson Labs in IBM New York built the Deep Blue machine. And there was this multiple years over a three or five year period, uh, Deep Blue was challenging Gary Kasparov, who was at that time the world champion for uh, human chess. And, uh, you know, at that point, Gary Kasparov had the most the highest rating of any human chess player ever in history. So not only was he world champion then, he was also the world champion in terms of having the highest record and rating of any chess player in human history. So he was clearly the best of what humans had to offer. But in 1997, this picture is now iconic because there is a picture of Gary Kasparov playing against the machine against Deep Blue and he's put his head, he grabbed it by his both his hands and is contemplating his 19th move because this 19th move is when Kasparov realizes that the machine has beaten him completely, right? So this is the turning point where we start to see that here is a machine built by programmers, built by hardware engineers, Deep Blue, which essentially brings to bear heavy computing and is able to beat the human gold standard in terms of a human accomplishment. Because it's historically, we've always looked at uh, chess playing as a great accomplishment of intelligence. And if human chess playing played by the world's best player is the pinnacle of human intelligence, then how, when a machine beats it, obviously you have crossed a major point in history where you can no longer claim that humans are intelligent because they play great chess, because by that logic, you know, machines play even better chess. 
Now, the interesting thing that has happened in this time since then, in the last 23 years, is actually quite also remarkable. Today, uh, the world champion is Magnus Carlsen, uh, who I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. Magnus Carlsen has a very, very high rating. He's probably rated even higher than Kasparov. I'm pretty sure that is true. Uh, but in, the, in any case, he's by far the most dominant champion in the world today for human chess. However, in the last 27 years, chess playing computers also have become extremely good, learning from the deep blue experience and further innovations and further research in uh, deep learning and machine learning. Machines have actually progressed in chess playing much faster than humans. Uh, this chart, what it tells us is that in the last 23 years, chess playing computers have become so good at playing chess that they're regularly beating the world champion now. At that point in time, beating the world champion, human world champion was a big accomplishment. Today it is not. Because if you look at this uh, slide here, and in fact, if you pay attention, it shows that the first, in, in a list of chess playing winners between machines and humans being on the same list, the first time a human appears on the list is on number 54. So Magnus Carlsen would have been number 55. So in other words, the first 54 entities which rank higher are all machines or all computers, right? Or all software hardware combinations or just pure software. So if that is true, that the, the most accomplished human player in the world is now ranked number 55, and this is like a two, about a two year old slide. So I went back and looked yesterday night just to kind of refresh myself because I expected in the last two years more progress would have happened. And lo and behold, today Magnus Carlsen is ranked number 77 because the first 76 entities that play chess are all computers. What that tells you is that not only have machines become very good at doing things that humans can do, certain things in this place playing chess, they are now progressing at a rate which humans can never catch up with. For example, you know, this idea of uh, rating, uh, yellow ratings and feeder ratings, which chess players have, uh, humans, you know, 2,800, you know, high, close to 3,000 would be a great rating. But now machines are regularly at 3,000 plus ratings. So, there's now a, almost a significant gap that has been built up that humans cannot expect to cross. In fact, Magnus Carlsen himself has said that his only goal in playing a great chess computer is to get a draw. He knows he can't beat a machine consistently, right? So that is actually where we are in terms of progress of technology and especially in terms of chess playing computers. So I'm just giving you one example of a Turing test where the machines are beating humans hollow by clearing the Turing test on a regular basis. So this is a bit of a framework slide. I want to use this to talk about the rest of my content after this, but let me start by just giving you a very simple view that when we think of AI, um, you know, there's a lot of concern that we all have that, oh my God, you know, AI is coming and AI is going to displace human labor. To some extent it's true. Technology does displace human labor and especially on the low end of the skill set, displaces even faster. But as time goes on, you know, if you look at the, how AI is progressing today, it is not just the competition with AI and humans that we have to worry about. We, there's also a lot of possibilities that come. So, and I'll talk about how, if you look at AI with the right lens, with the right perspective, it is also a collaborator. It makes human lives better. It is not just that it's competing with humans for jobs. It can actually help humans lead, lead better lives. So I'll show you the collaboration. As you go further, further evolution, you will see that there are now technologies, which I'll show you some examples of, where clearly it is believed that uh, in the future, and perhaps even already happening to some extent, machines can play a very important role in given humans company, right? In terms of giving them friendship, in terms of giving them some kind of a sense of uh, belongingness. So that's actually an interesting idea that machines can become closer and closer, they come closer and closer to humans in terms of what we expect from humans. And then there is convergence. You know, all of us are used for a few hundred years to put on eyeglasses to improve our reading. We are used to putting hear aids, hearing aids to improve our hearing. We are willing to put implants in our teeth to improve uh, our teeth. So we're always willing to put some technology into our bodies historically. But now you can see that if you start thinking about what we can plant into our brains, we can actually be much better humans than we are otherwise. So that's called convergence, where not only does the technology live with us, it comes to embed itself inside us. And that actually can create a whole new set of possibilities. So I'll show you that as well. And then finally, the most, uh, I would say, the advanced idea here is singularity, which some of you may have heard of. Uh, you Google singularity, especially in physics, you know singularity, of course, but if you look at uh, computing, singularity is the idea that when a certain amount of deep technology takes over the universe and we all start using it in different ways, a whole bunch of things that we took for granted no longer apply and a whole bunch of new things start to happen. And I'll show you an example of that also, right? And that might be all very surprising to you. So this being the framework that AI is nothing but a progression of various ideas. And over time, it 
starts off looking like a sort of simple competitor, but then if you pay attention, it looks like a collaborator, looks like a companion, looks like a piece of you know, that converges with your own body, and then eventually, you know, we start to see and do things that are unprecedented and not possible to do today in our current, uh, you know, sort of worldview. So the first part, of course, we talked about AI's competition. This is, of course, something you know we'll, you will all relate to. Uh, you know, there is talk about how you know uh, autonomous cars or self-driving cars. You know, you don't need drivers anymore. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing if you are somebody who commutes 100 kilometers a day for whatever reason you drive. Well, guess what? You can use that time to read your email or read your newspaper because your car is driving itself. So that's a good thing. But on the other hand, if you look at employment generation through Uber or Lyft or uh, Ola. Uh, and all of these companies. Well, guess what? If all those cars eventually became self-driving, a whole bunch of people who have a livelihood would not have that livelihood. So there's a pros and cons to this whole idea. So clearly, in many ways, uh, we talk about these kinds of work, but don't be surprised to hear that, you know, today there are software which can write articles. So, you know, what a journalist is supposed to do, a lot of software can do. There are today software that can actually look at a legal document and give a summary. So what lawyers used to do, you know, a lot of computers can do. There are machines which can look at a bunch of diagnostic reports from labs and give you a diagnosis. So what doctors are supposed to do, machines can do. So in many ways, there is a legitimate fear that a lot of these, uh, you know, sort of AI technologies can displace, uh, you know, sort of human labor and therefore create a world in which humans have less and less to do. And therefore that has implications on, you know, their jobs, livelihoods, economics, etc. Having said that, um, you know, if you probably look at the world of medicine today, radiology is an area where, you know, you might know radiology, where the people who look at uh, x-rays and scans and MRIs and so forth, and they give an opinion. Well, I think that's a field which is totally getting disrupted because as we'll show later, uh, AI and machine learning has reached a point of evolution where human vision is not as strong as computer vision. So computer vision can see better and more clearly in many ways than human vision can. This is the equivalent of the chess playing problem. You know, there came a time when the chess playing computers became better than human compute, human chess players. On the other hand, in the case of computer vision, the time has come when people who look at images and give diagnosis, like radiologists, well, unless they become AI assisted and AI equipped, they're not going to have their careers be old school. They're not going to be able to look at all their lives, people's scans and give opinions because all the scanning machines are now getting software to look at uh, the image itself and then decide and give some diagnosis, which the human has to review. So we'll talk about this, but the basic idea here that I want you to understand is AI as a competition may dominate the airwaves and the news and the, you know, you might read about it as a great threat, but trust me, this is only the, the small part of the entire story. The much bigger story is what I'm going to talk about from this point on. So the second point in my evolution is that, okay, if AI is competition, but much bit more than that, what is that thing that AI can do for us? And here is what I talk about collaboration. So is it possible to actually look at AI as a way to lead better lives? Can technology in the form of artificial intelligence, in the form of other kinds of technology, make easier, make it easier for us to humans to perform better? So if you think of AI not as a competitor to a human, but as an assistant to a human or a collaborator with a human, you will actually get a different result. And one great example of that is this idea of a Da Vinci surgical robot. Now, if you drive around any metro city that you might live in, you might discover that you know, that um, there are big signboards which say that, you know, please get robotic surgery, please get robotic surgery, right? And robotic surgery is an area where you essentially have to um, sort of, I'll show you a video in a second, just give me a minute. So robotic surgery is an area where, you know, a lot of people, if I ask them the question that, hey, would you be willing to be surgically treated by a robot or a human? And I always get 50% people saying that, okay, I want, I'm okay to have a robot treat me because I think the results might be more precise and my treatment might be much better because I can get better results. On the other hand, some people say, no, I don't want to be touched by a machine. I want to be touched only by a human. So that's a preference that you all have. But one thing is very clear. When you talk to surgeons today, especially robotic surgeons, they will tell you that they are able to do much, much better quality work because they're using a robotic arm or a robotic surgical platform like Da Vinci, because they can give their patients better relief. They can give them faster recovery. They have to, you know, you can go back home the next day as opposed to after one week because your blood loss is less, your muscle cutting is less, or whatever reasons that might be medically. And I'm not a doctor, but I can tell you that a lot of surgeons have told me that they're very happy and in fact delighted and will never go back to a world of pure human surgery because the robotic surgery gives them so much more capability and competency to augment and enhance their surgical skills, right? One doctor told me that, you know, the reason he uses robotic uh, platforms 
because he says that the human hand has a restriction it can't twist itself all the way to 180 degrees right so you can't like for example you can't rotate your wrist all the way and bring it back right you have to go one way and then come back again so if you had a full rotation wrist you might be able to do certain kind of surgery which you know this robotic arm can do because humans can't do that so what i'm going to show you is a little video and the video is interesting because this is a demonstration video of the surgical platform and how a human surgeon is using robotic arms to solve a particular problem the problem here is to show you the precision quality of this surgery and of course i'm not going to bother you with the showing you real surgery because that's probably too gross for all of us but this particular demonstration shows that you take a fruit like a grape you know a simple grape which we eat you know we can pop a grape in our mouth and eat it but here's a simple grape that is being surgically treated in terms of being cut being stitched and all of that and this is all being done through a robotic arm that a surgeon is using and the surgeon is not near the grape the surgeon is somewhere far away using his robotic arm to solve problems and i want you to keep in mind the possibility of this today with remote telemedicine if somebody needs surgery 300 you know kilometers away from the main city and the surgeon is sitting in the city it's quite possible to design a system using what you'll just see that you can remotely conduct surgery with some junior surgeons attending physically but the expert surgeon is surgically operating from 300 miles away it's quite possible so just take a look So if you notice the last uh, few seconds, uh, this was surgery of a grape being done inside a bottle. And uh, it's been done inside a bottle and the surgeon is sitting somewhere far away. So that is, gives you a power of how technology or surgically assisted, uh, robotically assisted surgery can provide such a great experience for, um, for the patients and the doctor. The next thing that I talked about earlier, if you remember in my curve of going from competition to collaboration, the third thing on that journey was companionship. Now, let me tell you the background for this, why this is an important uh, concept to understand, right? Um, if you think of public health, today, of course, we are in the middle of a pandemic globally. So public health, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is infectious disease. You talk about viruses, you talk about bacteria, you talk about vaccines, you talk about all those things that are currently dominating the media, rightly so, right? We all need a vaccine very, very quickly. But if you really step back and think that what is going to be the biggest public health problem in the 21st century, there is usual consensus across all, uh, all quarters that the biggest challenge we will have is loneliness, people living alone. Because, you know, human life today run, runs much longer. You know, we average expectancy maybe 75 in certain countries in India. It's certainly in the high 60s. Developed countries is in the mid 80s, right? So people live much longer, 20, 30 years more than they used to live in terms of lifespan, right? But if you think of what that means, it's quite likely that in that process, you become alone because your kids have moved away, your spouse may have passed away. You know, so if you think about your own grandparents, each of you, you'll start to realize that, yes, you know, that's true because people above 75 can often have a tougher life because they're living alone. And when people live alone at that age, there's a lot of risk in that because physical risk, emotional risk, other kinds of risks, security risk. So the idea here is that um, can we build technology that can provide a very active companionship to elderly people who are living alone. That is the problem statement. So with that, I will now show you a little video, which essentially has been designed by an Israeli company. The system is called LEQ. Uh, LEQ is a, uh, essentially a social companion robot. Maybe that's the best way to describe social companion bot, which is designed to make the lives of elderly people better, especially those who live alone. 
Now, please watch this video and tell me if, of course, you know, you may say this technology is not good enough yet, but that's okay. All technology evolves with time, but the idea is powerful that we're going to live in a world where people live alone and they need companionship. So this is how technology can possibly help. Mary, Megan sent a new photo. Would you like to look at it? Yes, please. Oh, he's a gem. Would you like to respond to Megan's post? Sure. Recording in three, two, one. LEQ reminds me to take my meds, arranges rides for me. She even reminds me of all my appointments. Mary, don't forget bridge with the Golden Girls at 1 p.m. Would you like to practice? Oh, I don't need to practice. I didn't catch that. Do you want to play bridge or not? Oh, fine. Let's play. Mary, you wanted to Skype with Liz. Would you like to do that now? Oh, sure. That sounds great. Hey, honey. Hi, Mom. Hey, I just noticed. Is it a little cool in the house? Oh, it feels great. I'm doing my Tai Chi now. Yeah, I can see. Okay, Mom. Just checking in. You take care. I'm fine, sweetie. Chat later. There's a new TED Talk waiting for you if you'd like to watch it. Or perhaps you could go for a walk. Well, that's a good idea, LEQ. Great, Mary. I'll be right here when you get back. Great! So if you notice that particular uh, video carefully, there was some area where you know it listed the the person listed um, the kind of things that LEQ is doing for her, including reminding for medication time, uh, what medication to take at what time, uh, you know, taking care of your email and communication, uh, actually giving you a bit of a pep talk because sometimes you get depressed and you get a little bored and you don't want to go out and do take your walk. Um, so this is a pep talk that the sort of soft the machine is giving. So. All of you are familiar with Google Home or uh, Amazon's Alexa, this would come across to you as a specialized case of such a device, a home device, which can really be designed to understand uh, elderly people. And the, the AI part of it is interesting. This, is, this bot is going to learn. This bot is going to learn in companionship with the person that they're servicing, which means that if your grandmother versus somebody else's grandmother is using the same technology, if you go back after one year, you will find that this particular bot is much more tuned to your grandmother's behaviors and habits and has learned about her habits and patterns of how she does things. So in other words, machine learning can be applied in this case and is being applied in this case for the bot to become much more close, quote unquote, to this particular person. It is not a generic bot. It's actually a bot that can learn about the person that they're spending time with and become closer to them by learning their behaviors and adapting its behavior around it. So now that is actually what we consider humans to be good at, right? We consider humans to be good at adapting and understanding the person and then becoming much more close to them. So all of the terms are just used, you would normally use in the context of human relationship, but here is technology. This particular Israeli company is trying to build a bot that can do that kind of human activity, right? So in many ways, I think this is very powerful because while this may be technology that is in its early stage of infancy or development, this is certainly going to catch on as time goes on because we all need devices to lead better lives, especially for elderly people. So moving on from here, I will now um, talk about the next one. And this is actually probably where, you know, you might find this, what the heck, you know, what is he talking about? Now, if you really go back and study this problem, um, you know, there's a very famous computer scientist called David Levy, who's also a very well-known chess, uh, computer, chess uh, sort of computer scientist. He's played a lot of professional chess. He's built chess playing computers. He has been with MIT. And he has essentially been looking at the problem of saying that, okay, you know, when do you think we'll come to a point where robots become sufficiently intelligent and interesting that humans would consider marrying them. And that's actually what he predicts. He says that 2050 is the year where he expects legalized marriage to happen between humans and robots. In other words, that may lead to a convergence concept of a robo sapiens and not homo sapiens, right? So this is, of course, very, very uh, futuristic prediction. And I'm sure all of us will say, you know, this is crazy. This doesn't make any sense. But if you really think about it for a minute, uh, once 
the example I gave you earlier, you know, um, the, the device that can learn about the person it is spending time with and become, you know, much more adapted to helping them lead better lives. I mean, in some sense, that's companionship and therefore the progression logically would be that, okay, you know, that can lead to this. However, if you look at David Levy's own track record, he was the one who predicted that somewhere in 1995, 1996, the first computer would defeat the world chess champion. And he was largely accurate because it happened in 1997. He was pretty much on the money in terms of his prediction. So I would not write off a man like David Levy easily because his past predictions about AI have all come true. So by that logic, you know, what he predicts may seem wild in 2020, but 30 years from now, who knows? Let me now move to the next C, which is the fourth in that list of Cs that I talked about. I talked about you know, competition, I talked about collaboration, I talked about companionship, let me talk about convergence. Now, all of us, uh, you might know this, that as we get older, we develop a whole set of problems that are largely chronic in nature, and that is natural human aging. You know, so let's say memory loss, right? We start forgetting things. You've seen this in your, if you're a young person, you've seen this in your parents or in your grandparents. And if you're not a very young person, you've seen this in yourself. And I can see that myself, you know, when I turn 50, looking back, my memory is a lot less sharp now than it used to be, right? Then you have hearing loss, blindness, you know, some kind of accidents, paralysis. All these examples I give you are essentially your brain is getting a little damaged. Uh, whether it's for medical reasons or because of aging or whatever reasons, there is always a neurological deficit. We call it neurological deficits that keep building over time. Now, if you were able to augment yourself through technology to make it better. So for example, I gave you this example at the beginning. I said, okay, my eyesight fails. We have no problem going and getting glasses. And in fact, we think of glasses not just as uh, medical enhancement tools, but we also think of this fashion. In fact, wearing glasses is cool. You know, a lot of people spend a lot of money on fashion, fashionable wear, eyewear, and that's a great business. We are willing to do that for a hearing loss. So the question is, when memory loss happens, am I willing to put a chip in my brain, which will actually augment me with memory? Yeah, and maybe it'll connect me to the cloud where all my database is kept. So, you know, if I met you in, let's say, 2010, and I'm meeting you again in 2020, and then you walk up to me and say, hey, Shantanu, and I'm thinking, I remember this guy. Uh, his name is either Raghav, is it Raghav or is it Madhav? I can't remember that. Well, guess what? This will tell me it is Madhav and not Raghav, right? So that's the kind of problem that this can, can solve. The other thing that, can, that this can solve is also a very, very powerful learning problem. So let's say you're working for a software company that says, you know what, uh, tomorrow you are, this weekend you're traveling or maybe in a week's time you're traveling to Japan and you have a six month assignment in Japan, right? Well, guess what? Uh, if, you, if this technology actually worked, you would be able to implant yourself with a Japanese learn language chip and make that trip. And you would be able to speak Japanese when you arrive, right? So, so this is the potential of this technology to say that, can I implant myself with technology that can enhance my capability or restore my capability, right? Restoration and enhancement. Uh, those of you who have seen the movie Matrix, you remember that there's a particular scene in which Keanu Reeves is lying down and he's being pumped with all this augmentation and he gets up and says, now I know Kung Fu. So he's learned Kung Fu through this technology intervention. The basic idea here is that, you know, um, humans are, you know, while collectively we're very strong, as individuals, we are weak, we have physical limitations, we have other limitations. If you connect humans through some technology into a cloud-based infrastructure, well, guess what? We can become much more powerful and we can become much more capable and we can build competencies quickly. Right? So, so this is, of course, very, very sci-fi oriented thinking. And of course, you've seen all the movies of sci-fi that does this all the time, there are plenty of such examples but i would not take it lightly to say that this is not going to happen this is going to happen in fact there are research projects today which show that you know can you send an email to somebody or can you send a text message to somebody just by thinking about it can you dictate in your brain as opposed to typing it in or voicing it out right so these are the kinds of things that convergence will do for us it will give us a chance to look at technology the way of augmenting our capabilities now of course one can say this is very dangerous because you know your your if you connect it, your brain is connected to the cloud then you can be hacked, and if you can be hacked, then people can steal your memory. You know, all that stuff, of course, is true. But then, you know, what is the fun in computer science if everything is risk-free? It's only when things have great reward and great risk, it becomes an interesting deep tech problem to solve. Okay, so moving along, uh, I had mentioned this before. I'll just make a quick reference to it again, that one thing that we have to understand today, which is at the heart of a lot of the great progress in machine learning and AI that we see, is fundamentally the point that somewhere about three years ago, 2017, or maybe even 2016 onwards, you know, the human performance zone, you see that five to 10% band at the lower end of the picture, which goes across. 
So when a human looks at an image, when we as humans look at an image or look at an object, we have between a five to ten percent error rate in terms of how we make mistakes. So let's say it's dark in the evening and you see a moving animal on the street in front of your house and you are kind of thinking, oh, it's a cat, but it turns out that it could be a dog. So those kinds of mistakes humans make all the time, right? However, it's not coming through. Just one second, I'll just fix my. I'm sorry, there was a bit of a technical uh, difficulty. You might now be able to see it, hopefully. So I was just showing that this particular chart is a human performance zone. So humans have a tendency to make errors uh, in looking at things. Our, our vision is not perfect. It's very good, but it's not perfect. So for example, if I look at a cat or a dog, I might make a mistake saying that, okay, this is actually a cat, but it actually might be a dog. And this error rate of five to 10% is a common problem across humans that if you show me hundred objects, I'll get maybe 93 of them right, you get seven of them wrong. Yeah. Now this test has been automated and people have been building algorithms in computer vision to check that how do we get machines to recognize better? In other words, bring the error rate of a machine to recognize an object to lower than that of humans. And this has been accomplished. As you can see, even 10 years ago, you know, humans had a 25% plus error rate. But today the error rate has come to the right side in just seven years in 2017, it's below 5%. So today you can actually say that a computer's vision is far better than that of a human. So this is an important development that leads to this. And this is my next uh, sort of, you know, challenge to you, right? Uh, this is the problem, what we call the Rembrandt gallery problem, which is to say that, you know, this famous painter who lived 400 years ago in, in Holland, uh, he lived in uh, Amsterdam, and uh, this is, his name is Rembrandt, and he's a world-renowned painter. Now, Rembrandt was famous for his portraits. He made portraits of lots of people, lots of his friends, lots of his business colleagues, lots of his acquaintances, and he built this enormous gallery of portraits, right? So a few years ago, a team from Microsoft started applying AI and data science to understand how to create new Rembrandt-like paintings. In other words, can you have a computer create a painting, a creative computer that creates a painting that will be such that uh, even a Rembrandt expert will look at it and say, yeah, this could be a Rembrandt painting and not be able to detect. So you can see the echo of Turing test again, right? The Turing test basically says that a, a computer produce a painting that can fool an art critic to think it's a Rembrandt painting. So this is the challenge they wanted to take on. And so my challenge to you is that, you know, I should have had a poll for this. I'm sorry, I don't have one. But of these four pictures, three are original Rembrandts, and one of them is actually painted by a computer which has understood, which has learned how to paint like Rembrandt, right? So to state my problem again, three paintings in this are done by Rembrandt himself 400 years ago, and one of them is done by a computer which has learned to paint like Rembrandt a few years ago. And how did the computer learn this? Well, the computer basically consumed, quote unquote, all the Rembrandt's portrait paintings, learned, applied machine learning and deep learning techniques to build its network, neural network, to say that, okay, now I can generate paintings which are of the type that a Rembrandt would produce. Now, if you think of it for a minute and think and say, what happened to the neural network? In the process of consuming all of Rembrandt's paintings, it's, the neural network became like a Rembrandt brain. In other words, became a copy of Rembrandt's artistic brain. Right? So because the artistic brain of Rembrandt has been now captured in a computer through algorithms and a you know, deep learning algorithm, set of algorithms in this neural network, well, guess today it's kind of as good a replication of Rembrandt's artistic brain you'll ever get. And therefore now Rembrandt can live on uh, you know, completely forever without having to die because even though the person has gone away, you could actually look at this and say this person's creativity can be continued by a computer which has replicated its artistic brain. Now, this is a pretty profound thing to say, and this is like a singularity point I was making, that in singularity, start, things start happening which make us completely stunned. So you could argue that, okay, you know, some famous poet like Rabindranath Tagore, you know, if, some, if a machine can consume 5,000 poems of Rabindranath Tagore and say that, okay, I have figured out how Rabindranath composes poetry and starts producing poems that people look at and say, yeah, this could be Tagore. So that would be a fantastic thing, right? Or somebody who has a great musical skill, you know, somebody who goes through all of A.R. Rahman's music compositions from the beginning of his career and says, okay, you know what? I can now, I figured out how Rahman composes and therefore this algorithm will be able to generate music that will sound like Rahman's music. So these are all the possibilities that are now possible in singularity because the technology has gotten us to the point where all this becomes feasible. I know I'm running out of time a little bit, so I'll speed up my game somewhat. Um, if you, okay, one second. Okay, so I'm going to now um, 
sort of move to the next part, which I'll speed up a little bit. Maybe in the next 10 minutes, I'll do this and then I'll open up for questions. I think I've talked a lot about AI and machine learning on purpose because that's where in some sense, uh, you know, 50% of the deep tech that we talk about is pertaining to AI, machine learning and data science today. And I'm sure all of you have a great interest in the topic. But now I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about blockchain and fintech, right? And, you know, all of you probably are huge, uh, you know, beneficiaries of the fintech revolution without quite realizing it, right? So I'm sure all of you use Google Pay or you use uh, Phone Pay or you use some kind of a, a Paytm based application. So, you know, today, for example, if you look at it, you know, uh, the idea of a bank is becoming less and less important. This is a picture that comes from The Economist magazine's cover page about a year ago, where uh, economists said that, you know, the traditional idea of a bank is collapsing. And you can see the digits are floating off. So the pixels are breaking up. So essentially, technology is disrupting banks, and that is called fintech. And that's a area of deep tech that some of you will really know about. But this is a very important idea because India is one of the world leaders in fintech today. And I'll spend the next few minutes talking about why India is a leader in fintech. So many of you who are considering careers in deep tech should look at fintech as one such example where a lot of transformation, a lot of disruption is actually happening. Bill Gates, the famous Bill Gates, uh, many years ago made the statement, which I think is very uh, insightful statement. He said, of course, all of us need banking. But do we really need banks? In other words, he first, first wanted to say that bank is not a physical entity. It is not a building. A bank is a piece of software. And a piece of software like a bank can be run by a tech company. It doesn't have to be run by a bank. So let me tell you an example of that. Um, underlying all of your payments that you make through Google Pay or Phone Pay or Paytm, there is a whole engine of called UPI, Unified Payment Interface. And if you go and do some Googling on UPI and understand how UPI works, UPI is one of the greatest you know, contributions of India to global technology in the last 10 years. In fact, it started in 2016, 15 kind of a time frame. In five years, worldwide, country after country has acknowledged that India is a world leader in fintech innovation for the simple idea that UPI is a way of sending money to people uh, from one person to another, making it as easy as sending an email, right? So when I say that Shantanu at talentsprint.com is sending an email to my friend Ajit at you know, some other company, that would be how I send emails. I can attach documents. So if I can attach a document to an email, why can't I attach a payment to an email-like idea? So the idea of a unified payment interface or a UPI identifier, unique identifier, is that, you know, if my bank is Citibank and your bank is SBI, then each of us have a email ID-like identifier, unique identifier, which is our payment address. So when you think of how you send money, historically, we say NEFT, bank account, IFSC, all that good stuff, you know, a lot of privacy information gets disclosed. For me to send you money, you have to tell me where your branch is, what your bank is, and what your account numbers are, which are really not a good thing. So we don't want to share our account numbers publicly with other people, even if they're sending us money. But when you have an abstraction like this, it's just like email, right? When I send email to you or you send email to me, I don't have to know, you don't have to know whether I'm running on Gmail or you're running on Outlook or whatever in underlying software you might be using. I don't have to know anything. I just have to know your email address. Similarly, if I had a unique payment address, it's called the VPA, virtual payment address. If I had a unique payment address where I could receive money, then I could then decide how to put the money into my bank. So you send me 100 rupees, I decide to put it in my, uh, you know, SBI account or ICIC bank account, HDFC account. So, the idea that you can make sending money as easy as sending email uh, through attachments and uh, attaching documents, this UPI is India's greatest invention and greatest contribution to the world today. Right? It is the reason why today India is seen as a great fintech uh, sort of, uh, I would say revolution is happening in India is because of this one major innovation that came from UPI. So let me show you uh, an example of what that has meant, right? I mean, here is some data to show you how fast UPI is growing and how much it has grown. Um, December 2016, which is probably exactly four years ago now, we are in September, so this is just short of four years ago, um, the UPI transactions were happening one million transactions a month. That's one million with an M, right? Then in end of one year later, it became 100 million transactions a month on UPI. Then about not just less than a year ago, it became 1 billion with a B per month UPI transactions. And we believe that we are probably not very far, maybe in another 18 months, I would say maybe maximum two years, we are going to cross 1 billion UPI transactions a day, which means that each of us in this country has a billion people, each of us send one transaction on the UPI every day, you get a billion a day. Now, when we talk about scale, you know, in technology, we, we talk about enterprise class application. This is not enterprise class, this is citizen class. This is every citizen is now participating in the system. 
So this is a great example where uh, UPI, which is run by a company called NPCI, where I'm a director on the board of NPCI, I can tell you that this has been one of those great stories of Indian innovation. I think sometimes in India, we don't recognize our great achievement. This is one of those great achievements where the world looks at India as an innovation hub in fintech payments because of this great invention called UPI. So moving along, um, there are other things like that. For example, uh, you know, I talked about payments, but then you know, all of you are probably familiar at this point that you can take loans on your phone, right? So you know, it takes very little time to get a loan approval on a phone up to lakh, two lakh, three lakh kind of payments. This was never possible before. Now it's possible. Of course, many of you in the millennial generation will find this to be natural. But those of us who have a history of what it takes to get a bank loan through a proper process historically would take weeks and months to get an approval. Now it takes minutes. So again, smartphone revolution has done this along with AI and data science. The third piece, all of you on the highways have seen FastTag. You have seen, you heard about, uh, you know, how FastTag is run by the NETC system. Then there is National Common Mobility Card, which is coming. So one single rupee card, you can do public transportation anywhere in the country. That is the vision. So in other words, you can talk about digitalization of the economy. Each and every piece of our lives, citizen lives, are going to get digitalized. Right? This is a great disruption that is happening in India and worldwide. And all of you who are coming out as with new graduation and new degrees should aspire to be part of such great revolutions. I'll just probably spend maybe just a few minutes now. I'll just jump through this because it's probably too complex. I'm going to end with something a little more provocative and interesting. You know, I'm a foodie. I love to cook and I love to explore new kinds of food. So, you know, one of the things that I'm always interested in is how can technology change the nature of food? So I've got a couple of videos for you. Talk about how, you know, we talk about Internet of Things, but I'm going to talk about the Internet of Food. And with that, we will stop, right? So um, one idea that is there for a long time in IoT is the idea of sensors. That, you know, how can we use sensors? Now, the other problem we have to solve in agriculture and food supply is that sometimes we don't know where the food comes from. So if somebody says this apple is from Himachal, how do you know it's from Himachal? How do you know that is not somebody who's pulling a fast one, a middleman is kind of putting some low grade fruit and calling it Himachal apples or, or Kashmiri walnuts or whatever you have it, right? So this idea that food has a ori original source, um, this concept is called provenance. You, know, you can look up the word provenance. It basically says that when somebody says a particular food comes from a particular place, how do you verify it? How do you know it is true? Now, this problem can be solved using technology now, so using sensors and blockchain. So I'm going to just uh, you know, show you a little video uh, to show you how people are working on sensors that can make food supply chains very robust, very reliable, and authentic. That we can, when somebody says this thing has come from that place or this particular food item has been at a low temperature all the way through the cold chain and the cold chain was never broken, all of those kinds of things are very important to us in our food supply chain. So I'll give you an example of that. Please watch this video. So I have found that interesting. In fact, uh, you know, I always say that uh, you know the future of some of the Internet of Food is edible computing or computers you can eat. You can see that example there, where this particular sensor today it's a sensor. It's obviously highly optimized to be complete, like a sticker. It's like a sticker, which is so invisible and so transparent and so thin that it practically you can't see it, but it's playing the role of a sensor. Tomorrow they're going to put computing on it. They're going to put power sourcing on it, so therefore it becomes completely an independent computing device at a very, very, very fine scale. 
and then comes the best part which you see you saw the you know person biting into the apple so the sticker also becomes edible in the sense that it contains magnesium silicon all the good things that minerals that doctors tell us to take through vitamin tablets well guess what if these stickers are put on every food item that you purchase you know where it's come from you know whether it's been safe and you know whether it is reliable nobody's lying about its authenticity it's been in the cold chain and guess what it's in, it's basically invisible to the point of being un, un uh, you know it doesn't interrupt anything it doesn't disrupt anything on top of it it's edible so you can eat it so i call this edible computing or food or technology that you can eat right so that's an interesting idea that you think about my last uh, thing I'll, i'll end with this uh, is and you know, those of you who really pay attention to what's happening in the news one of the big challenges uh, of the world is now climate change right and because of climate change we're seeing unprecedented wildfires in various countries including the us we are seeing unprecedented uh, hurricanes tornadoes typhoons so all around the world climate change is catching up and it's extracting its revenge on humans for all the disruption we've done to climate negative disruption done to climate over the years so one thing that people talk about is food safety that you know how do we know in the future that we will not be in a situation where food will run out or better example those of you who watch movies you've seen the movie martian or if you're watching the current netflix show called away uh, it's going to mars and one of the great things that people talk about when you go to new planets and you want to colonize a planet you have to grow your food so you have to have a technology that can help you grow food so this is about that work that that can you use computing as a way to produce food right and just please watch this research from mit it'll give you an idea that you know even agriculture in a new scene through new lens is a deep tech problem. We got to follow a robot. Come on. All right. So they always put me right before lunch uh because I'm going to talk about food. So if you do a simple Google search on food crisis right now, you know, you get this kind of overwhelming we're talking about climate change, we're talking about 9 billion people by 2050, we're talking about GMOs being really good in some places, GMOs being horrible in other places, not enough water. Farmers will not look like this in the future. Okay? Don't worry. Farmers are going to look a heck of a lot more like this. Right? They're going to have specialized knowledge. They're going to know about electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, plant science, data science. And in fact, space farmers exist already. This is on Mir uh on Spa International Space Station right now. So, let's let's land some of space on this stage. So this is our food computer. You might ask, what does a food computer do? Inside of this portion of the box, we create and actuate climate. There's a designer climate in here. Things like CO2, O2, temperature, humidity, all of it being controlled by your smartphone, by a web app, whatever you want. When you plant a plant, data starts tracking to that plant. Okay? So, it creates a recipe. This is kind of the brain side, and then when you go into harvest, a plant you're going to get that recipe back. So imagine a Wikipedia full of climate recipes where you're like, "Oh, your basil was really good. I want to grow your basil. Download, download, actuate, grow basil." So let's start taking this thing apart. Really important first component, the case, right? Think of your iPhone case. This will eventually get totally personalized. You'll express yourself on it whatever it is that you want to do. but really important is what's going on in the climate chamber. So let's talk about these guys. These plants were actually grown uh in the food computer. And what you'll notice is right? So they actually have roots. This is a real plant that you can eat. In fact, I can just pick a pepper off of this from my lab. Check it out. It's a hot it's a hot pepper. <laughs> um <laughs> It's really hot. Um but You know, no dirt, all the minerals that you need inside of this water base. But you're like, how do the minerals get inside of the water? Aren't minerals in dirt? Turns out some dirt has minerals. Some dirt has things you don't want to eat. I'm sure you could imagine some places where you don't want to eat the dirt. So, check this out. A little set of peristaltic pumps. Inside of these peristaltic pumps, macronutrients nitrogen phosphorus potassium calcium magnesium boron trace elements ph balance and acid right because the water's too basic for the plants and a little yeast reactor i said reactor that's right you use water and yeast and sugar and you create co2 did you know that it smells like bread it's amazing so what about this crazy light it's, you know when you build things you don't always build them to take them apart <laughs> so Right? Why is my face look like this? 
This is photosynthetically active radiation, radiation in reactors and food. I know it's going to take a little getting used to, but this is the part of light that grows new plants. When plants see light, they green because they reflect it to you. They're only absorbing between red, blue, and infrared. Next on the list, don't forget your safety goggles and your pipettes because you're going to need them. And then, of course, what food computer would be complete without a motherboard? So let's pull the motherboard out. <coughs> All right. Now imagine if I can get it. There it goes. You've, I've now taken out the brain. Okay, this farm has a brain, but it's a brain that you know, right? Raspberry Pi, how many of you have programmed that? Arduino with shields, how many of you have played with those? Sensors that are attached that you can get on Amazon for not very much money. And of course, the box that's a crazy mess of wires, which is exactly what it is. All right. So I'll go back, and then you just have the chassis. So you're like, that's a super cool robot, but like, you only have one and I don't have one. Wrong. We've open sourced all of this, open source hardware, software, and data. You can now go to our website, pull down all the parts, and build your own food computer. So this is the future part, right? This student in a high school in, I think, 11th grade, that's a space farmer. Right? Space farmers exist in your schools, and they will in the future. So, what's the point? If we have a food computer, that's cool and all, but it's like another 3D printer. Imagine the world connected by strings. That's what we have right now with our food. We ship it really far. Now, imagine food computers coming online, sending data, sending one basil from the United States over to Africa, having them actuate and change one thing, then derivatively going forward and teaching each other how to farm. So this is not just my fantasy world. We've already started doing it. So these are places around the world that we've sent food computers of different sizes, little ones, big ones, warehouse-sized ones, and people are now shipping data. So <laughs> if you thought you missed Facebook, if you think you missed being the founder of Google, the Internet of Food is the thing that you can build. You have the power. These are the tools. This looks just like the 70s when they had weird personal computers. Right? Like you've seen the pictures. <laughs> this is the weird computer. The Internet of Food is being planted right now. Start hacking it. Thank you. So with that, um, I come to the conclusion of my presentation. Um, and thank you for listening. Surabhi, would you like to, um, are there any questions that you want me to answer? I know we yes, probably have just no. time for a few questions. Thank you. Please thank go ahead. You. Thank you for the brilliant presentation. It was lovely how you showed us how, without even realizing, Deep Tech has made such an impact on our lives and how we are all users of Deep Tech in some way or the other. So we already have some questions, Shantanu. So I'll start with this question that has... Uh, come from E. Kumar Sharma, who first congratulates you for your brilliant uh, presentation. And then he says, two problems. In the Indian context, challenges from babus and politicians, the former will want regulations and uh, the latter access and affordability. In which areas can we begin overcoming these challenges in India? Uh, hi, Kumar. Thank you for your kind words and good to see you on this. Uh, of course, uh, Kumar is a good friend, a uh, great journalist himself. Um, so, so, Kumar, I think, um, you know, I would say that uh, while it is easy to say that you know, it's normal for us to feel that India is just a too bureaucratic a country, I gave the example of UPI for a particular reason. Unified payment interface is a great contribution that has come out of the Indian system, and it's been a success story all the way through. So that's a good example where in fintech we are a world leader already. Uh, there are clearly examples like Aadhaar, where we have shown great impact. I can, uh, countries around the world look at Aadhaar and say, how do you get a billion plus people on a system like this with pure biometric identity? So in many ways, I think our innovation quotient seems to be quite high. But I do concede your point that there is a, just a, too much of a desire you know, uh, sometimes to hold things back. I, I think there are two competing forces. The, the innovative Indian is trying to break out and make things happen. And I think the bureaucratic Indian is trying to keep things under control. This will always be true. I also don't want to completely undermine the importance of compliance uh, because in certain cases, not all, but in certain specific cases, I think India's compliance is also very highly regarded. For example, uh, RBI, Reserve Bank, is seen to be a great regulator because RBI was able to protect India from the 2007-2008 financial crisis meltdown that happened around the world. So I would say that I'm cautiously optimistic that with the younger generation, millennials, people on the call who are watching, 
uh, and getting inspired with deep tech to do big things. Uh, you know, I, I think my primary purpose here is not to tell you how this great stuff is happening somewhere else. My primary purpose is to tell all of the participants here that the great stuff can happen in our own hands. And I think the kind of problems we can solve, the kind of opportunities that exist, uh, the smartphone, the internet, the high-speed connections, I think now give us enormous ability, open source technology, give us a lot of hope because India is ultimately a frugal engineering country. And I think the low-cost networking, low-cost smartphones and low-cost open source and no-cost open source, somehow I get a feeling that in the next 10, 20 years, we will see enormous innovation happen through frugal engineering for which Indians are well-known. So I'm, I'm kind of cautiously optimistic. Thank you, Shantanu. We have another question from Shivam Rajput. He says, he asks, do you think it is safe to give such power to automated systems? And what if the Chinese make a copy of it? Because in the recent time, it's a lot, uh, you know, it's a, we've seen a lot in the news about how Chinese are trying to, you know, get data and use it. And with a negative motive and how safe is this in the future? And he also talks about the emotional aspect, you know, how humans have emotions and do you think machines will be able to develop emotions too? They're two different uh, questions, uh, both yeah. very good questions. So let me start with the first one. Uh, I think uh, nothing truly powerful is ever truly safe, right? So if something is truly powerful, don't expect to be truly safe because the only thing that is truly safe is to not do anything, right? If you decide in the morning not to go out, you will not have an accident, right? So the point is that, you know, with, with risk comes reward, without risk comes no reward. So I don't think we should even expect anything truly powerful to be risk-free. The question is how do you mitigate risk? And how do you be responsible about the risk? I mean, you know, there's a whole subject called AI and ethics or ethical AI, because if you start looking at AI purely as a technology, you're going to start making some very dreadful decisions about humans and how to treat humans. So clearly, you know, if you look at China itself, there is this big point about how the Chinese government is always naming and shaming its citizens for not paying parking tickets by putting their face on a big billboard, electronic billboard in every rail station, right? So you might be a small person who's forgotten to pay a parking ticket, but the government will humiliate you in front of 1 billion people. So those are the kinds of things that can happen. So when technology is powerful, it will be abused. And you hope that regulators will protect some to some extent. You think people who are using it will have some ethics that they will use. And you also want governments to be benign, which is a problem right now. I'll be, I agree with you that around the world, US, China, India, across the world, I think the governments are largely at this point fairly nationalistic, inward looking, right? They're not what I call benign governments. I mean, people may disagree with me, but I think that worldwide uh, autocratic governments are now dominating the name of democracy rather than benign governments. So that's a different issue, right? So that I agree with you that things can go wrong, but hell, without that, there's no, no risk and no reward and no fun anyway. To the second point about emotions and machines, I think that's an, another Turing test kind of a question, right? I think the whole reason Turing test is so powerful is because Turing was the first mathematician or computer scientist to say that you should not ask this question that you're asking. In other words, to say that something has or doesn't have emotion cannot be a sign of intelligence, right? AI is about, AI says artificial intelligence. It's not about artificial emotion, it's AI. It doesn't have intelligence to solve problems because problem solving is the hallmark of intelligence and can machines solve problems. So that's what AI is about. So it's like saying, okay, you know, if, if you look at an airplane, aeroplane, or if you look at a bird, both are flying, but their mechanics of flying is completely different. One will flap its wings, one will have static wings, right? right? So therefore to say that, you know, oh, an airplane is not really flying because it's not flying like a bird, right? That question is what Turing fought against. Turing said that you should never ask that question. You should ask the question that is solve the problem in a way that the humans can accept it to be human-like solution. Whether it's thinking about it, feeling good about it, feeling bad about it, all those emotions are in some sense beyond the purview of computing. And that's what makes humans powerful. So tomorrow, if you say that, okay, I'm a radiologist and I've got a great AI tool that can tell me which tumor is uh, cancerous, which is not, I still have to communicate that result answer back to a patient and a family. So my communication skills will be hugely important as a human, which I can empathize. So I have empathy, which a computer doesn't have empathy. So between the technology and the technical skills of a machine and the human skills of human specialists, plus decision-making, plus making choices, there are a lot of things we can talk about, but I personally don't think human, the machine's not having emotions is a problem. In fact, I think it's a good thing. Right. All right, Shandru, I'll take one more question from Nigat Parveen. So we are asked that FinTech and healthcare have always been major focus on verticals of technology innovation, including deep tech. But of course, the current crisis has brought healthcare innovation to the forefront. What technologies are being used across the globe right now to settle this new normal? And there's also a personal question. What technologies are you using right now to cope up with the new normal? Okay. 
All right. Um, so regarding healthcare, I think I would just make a small correction to your uh, assertion that uh, you know fintech has finance has always been a great technology user, no doubt. Uh, healthcare and education are always considered laggards because doctors and teachers, and I'm sure there are teachers in this call who would not like it when I say this, but doctors and teachers are known to be anti-technology, right? They are called the laggard industries. However, post-COVID, both healthcare and education have gotten so badly disrupted that technology is no longer a choice. It is a must. You have to have it. You have to use it. Right? Now, specifically to the point about healthcare revolution, I think the biggest revolution is coming in, I mean, there are many revolutions coming, but one of them is coming in telemedicine, right? So let's look at it this way. The entire hospital model, just like education models, have been built on the idea of a campus or a big building that patients will come to the hospital to get treated. Yeah. And uh, if you have a small, if you have a very minor cough, you have to go to the hospital to get treated. If you have a major surgery, you have to go to the hospital to get treated. Now, this seems a little odd because now with COVID and the awareness about, uh, you know, vulnerability of elderly people, you don't want uh, your 75-year-old grandmother to go to the hospital for a simple cough. You want her to be treated easily. So telemedicine is therefore the outpatient department of a hospital can go from being brick and mortar to becoming digital, right? right? The inpatient department may continue to be, has to be high touch, has to be, people have to come in for surgeries. You can't do surgery on your own at home through a, you know, there's no such thing as self-service surgery, I hope, right? That's a bad thing. But having said that, you can do a telemedicine-based consultation for simple problems. So I think the outpatient department will get revolutionized, get digitalized, just like education is getting digitalized. Campuses are becoming less valuable. Their digital platforms are becoming more valuable. So I think to me, health tech, I agree with the point that healthcare, I think, is going through a major revolution. I think it's going to come out with major disruption and innovation, just like education will. Right. Okay, Shanu, I'll take one last question that is uh, been, uh, there. So they say a uh, human, so yeah, Subhajit Bakshi asks the central management unit that will store and analyze all data will also have a huge power, influ power to influence behavior and choices of millions of people in a fraction of a second over a chosen period of time. Given that we are already scapegoats to social media and search engine platforms who profit selling our data, what legislative and regulatory frameworks do you see coming in the future to safeguard this? That's a beautiful question. I mean, really very nicely put. Um, thank you for that. Surajit, is it? Very good. Yes. So, yeah. So um, I think this is a major problem that we have to tackle with. Unwittingly, in the last 10, 20 years, we have become prey to the attention economy where we, our attention is being manipulated, captured, packaged, and sold to advertisers, right? Why is Google and Facebook such a major, major uh, source of power today? I mean, I would say that Google, Facebook, Amazon and Microsoft, maybe the first three more than the others. I think these three, these companies are more powerful than any government, right? If I'm a law and order person sitting in Hyderabad trying to solve the cyber crime, I'm better off calling Facebook for help as to who's the person posting all this, who's the real criminal. Facebook will have a better answer about who the criminal is than I will have as a law and order professional, right? So that's the reality of how these companies have become, in my view, you know, super governments in some sense. They have so much data, so much control, so much power. So the premise is absolutely correct. It's a major challenge. And that's why you might have seen in the papers that uh, the US government is planning to launch uh, antitrust violations against Google. And that may come any time now. Any day now, you'll see antitrust violations, antitrust, uh, just, uh, antitrust uh, cases being brought against these big companies. So that's a fair point. Uh, so one is antitrust will happen. The other thing that will happen is privacy laws are being strengthened. I mean, you have seen GDPR in Europe. Uh, you probably, uh, you know that you may know that India's Sri Krishna Commission, uh, the one, the same Sri Krishna who did the Telangana Andhra Pradesh bifurcation report is also the person who's now handling the whole privacy law in India. So we are expecting a privacy law in India anytime uh, through the parliament. So I think in some sense, I would say that there is an awareness, a renewed awareness in the last one year that especially with the US elections being manipulated and so forth, Russian intervention. So I think there's a general understanding is that these companies have way too much power and they're not responsible users of the power. They're exploiting it, abusing it in many ways. They're doing a lot of good also, but they're definitely not using the information very responsibly. So, but whether governments have the ability to actually stop these guys enough, I don't know. Because at the end of the day, as humans, we seem addicted. We are fundamentally addicted to digital content. It's a fact, whether it's YouTube, whether it's TikTok, you know, uh, the, our addiction to digital content is deeper than our reasoning. We're not thinking about doing it. We are just wired brain wise to get hooked to certain things. I call it the electronic drugs of our time, not the chemical drugs. You know, in 1960s, you would get hooked to a chemical drug. Now we get hooked to digital drugs, which is the content. So our addiction being what it is, can governments protect us from our own addictions at one person at a time? I think it's a hard challenge, expecting too much too. So, uh, I don't have a good answer for you, except to say that, yes, this is a difficult problem. Aishandru, I'll take the last question now. 
the last question is asking you to comment about the the use of technology agri tech in india so how do you think uh, you know how can we implement ai in the agriculture space in the country this is sabir's question yeah thank you sabir uh, so yes absolutely i think uh, you know all of you who have a chance uh, to ever visit icrisat uh, icrisat i c r i s a t i think it's called institute for crop research for the semi arid tropics it's outside hyderabad um, it's a great place to visit to see how technology is being used for agricultural innovation and improving productivity and and ethical farming and all of that right so i think uh, whether it's uh, how you decide on your irrigation how you decide on your fertilizing how you decide on your pest control how you decide on when to harvest when to reap when to sow all of these are essentially decision making questions where ai data science is playing a big role so i think in india with a smartphone and cheap connectivity i think apps will do this work uh, and we will see a lot of innovation that's already happening in agri tech i think people tell me that today post covid the most innovations happening in health tech education tech and agri tech so just like these two have gotten a big flip from uh, covid i think so is agri tech and i think within the fact that technology is can make agriculture productivity very different and the fact that the world has a huge population of 7 billion going to 9 billion and the fact that climate change is destroying our habitats and the fact that people are trying to go to other planets all at the same time i think innovation in agriculture will be huge so that's a great area to focus that's why i wanted to put the internet of food as the last part of my presentation thank you so much shantanu for giving us an insight into the world of deep tech and telling us the plethora of opportunities that await us in that space a big shout out to our audience for being super interactive and engaging we'll see you all in another 45 minutes in the next session that is titled introduction to ai and data science thank you everybody see you all in another 45 minutes thank you so much thank you everybody bye bye